Well, good morning, Cedar Hills. Glad to see all of you here in person. Wow, what a, what a wonderful full attendance. And those of you that are online uh, that were too lazy to get up locally and make it, we're just glad that you're here with us. Pray God's uh, blessing on you. No, you know I'm just kidding. So I'm a, I'm a fan for tuning in wherever you are, whenever you can. Amen? But it is something about being here in person that's really a wonderful gift. I just want to say um, thank you for being uh, Cedar Hills, a generous faith community to, to want to look out beyond the four walls. I love the mission and heart of this, uh, the leadership here. And uh, I know I work for a nonprofit, and uh, that work that we do in the area of sexuality and, and, and addiction and recovery, betrayal, abuse. Thank you for supporting organizations like Life Choice that are helping men and women just know a healthier way to move forward in this arena. I love to be a part of a church that isn't inward focused, but saying we all exist here to be resourced, to help people in this world discover God's truth. So I just want to say uh, this organization... Uh, our fellowship have been, generous, have been generous to our organization in years past. It just means so much that our heart's outward focus. So uh, leadership, way to go. Thank you for keep doing that. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, we're in our series, Best Life Ever. And today we're going to talk about the best sermon ever preached today here by Rod Wright. And uh, so I'm excited to be here. No, today we're talking about process emotions. That's what we're talking about today. Process emotions. And so we're looking at this whole series. Uh, I, I'm actually excited about this because of the take that we have on that. I've come to believe that you don't have to live in the United States of America to have the best life ever. That there are people all over the world in different countries and nations and economic uh, situations that are discovering the best life ever. So this isn't about some kind of a economic thing. This is about Jesus engaging us into the life uh, uh, that he's called us to and to understand how to live our best life right now. You know, this, the, the, the premise of the series kind of came out of John three sixteen. for God so loved the world uh, uh, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him would not perish. Perishing in the Jewish mind was seen as not just a, a someday event, but an event that could happen here and now, just as if eternal life was that same thing. It was more about experiencing what we're experiencing in our day-to-day -day reality uh, John 17, 3, this is eternal life. Jesus says that they would know you, God, and, and his only son. So it's about relationship. And I would even say it's about quality of relationship that we live, God, self, and others. And then I love it, just looking at mindset, uh, which, it, which to me is the great word for repentance, which repentance isn't just one and done. It's an ongoing work of adjusting our mindset. Uh, Jesus said things like, uh, the time has come, the kingdom is, of God is at hand repent, change your thinking is what the word means. It's about mindset. Change your thinking and believe the good news. And the good news is that God is here to help us and uh, we don't have to do all this by ourselves. Uh, to me, the story of the gospel can be summed up in a really short phrase. Jesus didn't come to this world to change the mind, about, the mind of God about humanity Jesus came to this world to change the mind of humanity about God. If your vision of God is against trying to catch you, I would say you have a distorted view of God. This is a God who we see in Jesus who's offering us a better way, saying, take my hand. I want to help you. I want to heal you. Uh, I, I love you and care about you. That's the God we see in Jesus. And so this mindset shift is really good. We talked about relationships, uh, perfection. Doug gave a talk, rest in God. Uh, joy is a, cho a choice. Alyssa gave a talk, and I just would say that was a really great talk. If you get a chance and haven't heard that one, go listen to that one. It's, it's fantastic courage. Uh, when Ron talked on Costco ketchup, anybody remember that story? I found Christ during that story. That was awesome. That Costco ketchup story, I can't go to Costco without saying, Lord, who needs mustard? Who needs mustard, you know? Who needs a hot dog? I mean, you know, Costco, I love that story. It was, I, I got so much joy out of that. I'm enough. And then today we're going to talk about just how to process emotions. Here's the big idea today. Um, we want to learn how to identify our emotions and process them in healthy ways. You know, uh, sometimes we could, there, there's a piece of this that is true, and it's this statement. Emotions can deceive us or lie, but not all emotions are doing that. So we want to learn how to identify how we feel 
and then learn how to take what, what, what we have here and process that in healthy ways. And so I want to just look at that. As we look at Scripture, uh, the text of the Old Testament and New Testament coming together, Hebrew, Jewish, uh, Greek, Aramaic, different writings, different language, they use a the word often in Scripture, the heart, the heart, right? And we're going to look at a couple Scriptures, but the, the word heart kind of in, in, in the text of Scripture, it's kind of like this exotic cocktail of all kinds of different meanings of how they're describing to articulate things. They're talking about your, how you think, your mind, your will, your emotions. Even the heart is referred as the physical organ in your body. So sometimes when we look at heart in Scripture, we just have to really process it. Well, how did the writer intend to say this here? Well, let's look at a couple uh, Scriptures here as we, as we dive off into this talk, just about the heart. So let's go to the first one. Deuteronomy uh, 6. This was the Jewish Shema. This would have been something that would have been memorized and that families uh, would have uh, spoken over their kids, and, and kids would have learned at a young age. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your, there's the word, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So heart is almost a word that just says holistically, mind, will, emotions, all of you. Let's go to the next text. The purposes of a, let me start over. The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. Interesting scripture. I memorized this scripture in a different translation, so how many know that can get you messed up when you start to yeah. quote it? Yeah. The purposes, let's go back to that scripture if you would, uh, please. Go back one more. This scripture has a lot of meaning to me because... When I started uh, my recovery journey 26 years ago, uh, some of you know my story just about when my faith, how I perceived God wasn't bringing transformation and some of my early traumas as a young man and then how that played out in addiction with pornography for me and going to a therapist and getting some help. This was a scripture that God gave me that I really landed on. And for a year, I memorized this scripture, but I memorized it in a different translation. The purposes in a man's heart are deep waters but a man of understanding draws them out. And I would spend so much time saying, God, what's this about? As I looked at different ways that I would think and feel and believe and experiences that happened to me, and I began to go deep. How many know sometimes when you go deep in your heart, it can be scary, right? That's why we sometimes don't want to go there. But I found a lot of health and courage that I didn't have to go there alone. I had people and resources that walked there with me to help me learn some things. So that's another way we look at the heart. Let's go to the next scripture here. Guard your, what? Above all else, for it determines the course of your life. So here, the writer of Proverbs is saying, hey, your heart is something to be guarded. Be on, be on guard. There are things that want to damage or, or attack our heart, so be on guard. Let's go to the next scripture. It's a psalmist reading this. It's kind of a prayer to God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. So the prayer of saying, God, I open up my heart. I invite you to test me and to know my anxious thoughts and my emotions, my, my thinking. Inviting God's help. Jesus speaks about heart in a Sermon on the Mount. I would say this was probably the greatest sermon ever. <laughs> Jesus said, God blesses those whose hearts are pure. For they will see God. So Jesus was talking about individuals with pure hearts, and I think we're all made in the image of God, and as image bearers of God, uh, God made us in a way where our hearts are pure. But how many know sin, this disease that affected all of us, has a way of twisting or tainting sometimes our ability to think and to feel and to process things and act in, in healthy ways. In fact, here's another scripture, in, I think it's Jeremiah, uh -huh, I got it. Uh, Jeremiah, he wrote this about the human heart. How about this from a, the, the other end of the, of, the, of the spectrum here? The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. How's that for a word of encouragement? Who really knows how bad it is? So Jesus is saying, hey, you're blessed, those of you that have the pure of heart. And then Jeremiah over here in the Old Testament, he's this prophet. He's saying, man, the heart is the most deceitfully. And, and of all things, and desperately wicked. Interesting. 
This word wicked here in the um, Hebrew language, it, uh, it's translated into English here, is, uh, comes from an old English word, wickerware, uh, like wicker furniture, like something that has been twisted, right? Twisted. And so uh, here Jeremiah is saying something has been twisted, the deceitfulness. Now, the context of this scripture here when Jeremiah says, man, man's heart is wicked and evil, the context for him is they're sacrificing their kids to the false gods. How many say that's a pretty clear description of hearts when you, say, when you see that, right? Child sacrifice, that's actually, right, yeah, that's, that's very twisted, right? That wickedness in, in the hearts. And so this is an interesting scripture. It reminds me of just a story about, we're not maybe sacrificing kids, but how many know that sin has affected us and there are times we get distorted and our heart gets twisted, um, and I don't want to tell that story because I want to talk more a little bit later on in my message. So I'm not going to tell the story that just came in my mind. I'm going to move on. So let's go, let's go on to the next uh, verse. Not the Septuagint, but the one after that. Awesome. I love. Uh, way to go, Seth. Everyone give big Seth a big hand back backstage. <laughs> Seth, you're a rock star. Awesome. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the heart's desire. So here, the, the writer of Psalms is saying, hey, delight in God. And God will grant you the heart's desire. So there's a lot of different ways to think and to feel and to see about this whole perspective of, of heart. Like I said, the, the writers of Scripture I kind of saw it as this, uh, this almost cocktail of a different way to see it. But I want to kind of unpack different pieces of it when we talk about emotion. We talk about feelings and emotion. So sometimes, how many know we can get our feelings and thoughts mixed up? I mean, nod your head if you understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to give you an example, right? This is just an example. I can say something like this. I'm going to express a thought, but I express it in a way like an emotion, right? I can say this. I, this is not true. This is a hypothetical situation I'm, I'm uh, concocting here today. Uh, I feel like Weston, who leads the music on stage, doesn't like me. I feel like Weston doesn't like me, Right? So what, what have I done now? That's actually not a feeling. That's actually a thought. I think Weston doesn't like me. This is hypothetical, right? This just hang on. Weston and I are good. But I, I think Weston doesn't like me. Therefore, I feel sad, hurt, and depressed. This thought is causing these emotions to happen within me. Are you with me on that? So sometimes we say, Man, my thinking, my mindset really does affect sometimes my feeling. It is powerful, right? And like, man, Weston, he's like the epitome of coolness, Weston. And he doesn't like me, Whew. right? This, it, can, it can affect us. But sometimes now we have to learn how to discern our emotions. And, and we have to learn how to discern our thoughts, and that's what I want to move us into today here. Just some ways practically that, you, that, that we can do that. Well, let's talk about emotions. Emotions are this natural, instinctive state of mind. Uh, um, uh, how our mind can look at circumstances, our moods, or our things in relation to others. It's instinctive or intuitive feelings as distinguished from reasoning or, or knowledge. So it's this intuitiveness, this feeling I have, different from how I think, our emotions. Synonyms or, or words that are like this are instinctive, in, intuition, a gut feeling, inclination, sentiment, or a tenderness, or soft-hearted towards something, uh, the ability to feel things. Now, I think it's really important. I think God made us to feel um, and I want to just share some thoughts about emotions here real quick. But before I do that, let me just say this. In my journey of life and faith and family and society, the healthy individuals that I've come in contact with, the ones that are following Jesus and learning to implement the way of God, they're the ones that are actually okay with feeling. They've learned actually how to embrace their emotions and feel. In some of the healthiest family systems, it's okay to feel things, right? Right? And it's a little uh, tool that maybe some of us can take home today. You go around the table, and it's a little activity called sharing highs and lows. How many have ever heard of this? Highs and lows? 
Hey, what was your high this week or today? What, what brought you a, a feeling of, of, that you were comfortable with? And you can be just small and talk about what those are, right? Or, and then what was a low feeling? What was a feeling you had today that uh, brought some discomfort? And a lot of us were never learned how to identify and to feel and to express emotions. But I would propose that the healthier individuals we become, which is all about following Jesus and being mature, we can identify and feel our emotions. In fact, here's a little um, feeling wheel. How many of you have ever seen the feeling wheel here before? Right? This is a really great tool. You can go online and uh, Google this. If, you, if some of you are into Googling, you can, uh, you can Google it and find it. And it just has like happy, sad, disgust, anger, fear. And then it just branches out. Despair, guilt, all kinds of emotions, insecure, uh, peaceful, uh, powerful and healthy individuals and healthy families learn how to feel. Uh, in recovery, we say you got to feel to heal, right? And so feeling. My little uh, grandson, Louie, yeah, thank you for asking. My grandson, Louie, <laughs> has a little placemat that he sets on his table, and it has all kinds of different emotions. And uh, in fact, I was reading him a book uh, this, the, two, two months ago, a Sesame Street book about uh, Ernie's mad and Bert's upset, and it was all about uh, identifying your emotions. How do you feel on things? And I thought, man, this is really cool. But on his placemat, it says all these feelings, and he can do a uh, surprise face and sad face and grumpy face. He has all these faces because mom and dad are teaching him how to learn his feelings, express his emotions. And I think that um, sometimes our discomforting emotions like grief or loss those sometimes uh, are the hardest emotions to process for many of us. But anyway, we had the other end of the spectrum emotions because on October 5th, Louis had a little sister born. And I want to introduce you to little Holland. And uh, this has brought a lot of joy to our family, right? So when I found out Holland was born, I was on a trip for our organization in Texas, sitting in there with a cowboy with a patch over his eye, which is a great way to experience joy, you know. Uh, when, you're, when you're away from your family, but it brought so much joy knowing there's another little life brought into this world. We have all kinds of different feelings, don't we? Right? Well, let me give you some observations about feelings. Thank you, Holland, for participating with Grandpa today. Um, let me give you some things to uh, think about here with feelings. Identify feelings and process them, processing them in healthy ways. First of all, um, feelings aren't good or bad. They just are. Don't think of that's a bad feeling, but just think uh, feelings aren't good or bad. They just are. Think about Jesus as a human, all the emotions he had. Jesus had emotions like sadness, betrayal, lonely, painfulness, joy, laughter. How many have ever, uh, how many would just, when, when Jesus turned water into wine and did something and everybody was enjoying it, how many think Jesus maybe had a smile on his face? Right? He was like saying, you know, when Jesus was watching college football on Saturdays and his team won, <laughs> right? I don't know what that was like there in Bethlehem, but maybe it was a soccer game. I don't know what it was, you know. But, you know, that Jesus experienced all the array of emotions from anger to loneliness to sorrow, right? He felt the joy. Uh, so they're not good or bad. We just feel them. Also, second one, feelings can cause Comfort or discomfort. Some feelings are easy to feel, but some are difficult to feel. For any of you here that are navigating grief because of loss in any way, so I think Alyssa talked about losing her, her dog or uh, losing her grandma. We have uh, feelings over all kinds of things. And in my opinion, grief is some of the hardest work we do because those, comfort, those feelings are so uncomfortable to have to process. Or any kind of traumatic experience that happens in our life. And many times, when something traumatic or painful that creates uncomfortable emotions, like anger or fear or insecurity or devastates us or we feel shame around, those feelings, sometimes we just bury them because we don't want to have to deal with them because they're too uncomfortable. And so what can happen in any kind of loss is acute grief it can be like one or two years. We still feel that. The 28th of this month will be one year of losing my dad. Uh, 
And I'm grateful that he's not suffering and in pain, but how many know you feel that when an anniversary comes around, right? Um, two to th- three to five years can be carryover grief that we would feel. But if you take a loss or a trauma in your life and you don't deal with it, you just stuff it, that pain can last a lifetime. And many times when we don't know what to do with our pain because it's so uncomfortable, what we do now, instead of processing our pain, our emotions, we often, in our country especially, but all over the world because it's a global issue, we find things to cope and make us feel different. And this is where addiction can kind of happen in our life. It creates maybe dopamine to the brain. We do something different to distract us. And this is where, if we're not careful, feelings of, oh, that would be great. It can lead us to misuse or mismanage or take something that God gave as good and use it in a wrong way to bring destruction in our life. How many can understand that, right? So learning to process our feelings, even the uncomfortable ones, is really, really important to do. Here's the next thought. Here's the next thought coming up on the screen. Uh, feelings can inform us. Hey, what's going on? That, that triggered something in me, right? Uh, I was driving up to North Idaho uh, this morning, and I saw all the tamarack trees just lit up. And I had this emotion of, like, gratitude just wave o- wash over me about the beauty of where we live in this part of the world. And I was just thinking, you know, when we all get to heaven and there's that long line, we're going to say to everyone, hey, you get in front of us. We got to live in North Idaho. You know what I mean? <laughs> we, we got some of our heaven on earth right down here. But man, it was something that like it just informed me about gratitude, about gratitude for my life, for my family, for, for uh, this community of faith, just for all the things that God's invited me to participate in in, in, in this world. So they can inform us. Here's the last one. Our emotions can also deceive us. They can deceive us, right? If we're not careful, but yeah, but I feel it so strong. I I can identify it. I label it, and I feel it so strong, so it must be true. My therapist 26 years ago would say this to me. Rodney, feelings are like the tail wagging the dog. You're letting your feelings just control you rather than learning how to stop, process, and ask good questions. Is this true or not? Let's go back to my example that was hypothetical. I think Weston doesn't like me. Therefore, I feel sad, hurt, and depressed. So the question is, Rodney, why do you think Weston doesn't like you? Well, I was in Super 1 right here in this town the other day, and I walked by Weston in the aisle, and he looked at me but didn't say hi or wave or even recognize me. He ghosted me as he passed me with his shopping cart. And so, therefore, I know he's angry at me or he doesn't like me, and I have all these emotions. So I go to Weston, and I say, Weston, why did you ghost me in the Super 1 grocery grocery store the other day? Well, what day are you talking about? Well, on Saturday when I was there, you walked right by me. Weston says, I wasn't in town on Saturday. (laughs) I was somewhere else. So now I've made an assumption. You get what I'm saying? Are you tracking with me? What I thought was true, it wasn't even Weston in the grocery store. It was Tom Selleck in the grocery store, (laughs) right? Somebody else, right? Some other guy, right? So uh, that wasn't the the guy I was trying to use. Who's the uh, Mission Impossible guy? Uh, Yeah, I got the wrong guy. I got the wrong guy. I was so close. I was so close. Tom Cruise. Anyway, you get the point. The point is I had a thought that wasn't true. I was deceived by something. And that deception led to a negative feeling. And that negative feeling, if I'm not careful, can create a lot of lies about me. Well, he doesn't like me because I'm not what? Big enough, strong enough, smart enough, you, 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 right? And this is what happens with emotions sometimes. So they can also deceive us. In recovery, what, part of the work that we do in recovery, and recovery is just a fancy word for following Jesus, because <laughs> all of us are addicted to our way of thinking, and all of us are in need of recovery. So if you're in a recovery group, welcome to the party. I think the whole world should be in it. And that's why here at Cedar Hills, we're such advocates for group. We don't want you just to come and look at the bald spot on the back of my head on Sundays, or the, or the nice hair or head in front of you, we actually want you to get in group where you turn your chairs and you share your life with one another. Because it's in community, relationships is where we heal. The Christ in you can speak to the lie in me. And the Christ in me can speak to the lie in you. 
And I can see that you're good, made in God's image, but you've been deceived, twisted, and we can help untwist and help us see the truth and begin to live out this healing faith, this healing community that Christ has called us to. So when it comes to our feelings, I think it's really good to say, what am I feeling and why? What am I feeling and why? And then just learning how to process that in healthy ways. The key to health, the key, in my opinion, to living the best life ever is when you identify feelings and process them in healthy ways. And I really believe that Jesus did that. Think about Jesus at the garden before he's going to the cross. And he says to Peter, James, and John, hey, can you guys pray for me? I'm going to need a little help. Right? He's reaching out. He realizes there's a tough day coming for him. He realizes what's ahead. And he feels it so much where the scripture says that he sweats as if drops of blood. He's so overwhelmed, so stressed out about what's happening. And his group, when he comes back to see how they're doing praying, they're all snoring. They've all fallen asleep on him, right? That sense of just, though, that we need one another in this aspect. Here's what I think healthy people do in processing emotions well, because we don't want to cope anymore with addictive behaviors. And if you're in an addictive behavior right now, it's not just about Jesus is saying, stop behavior. Jesus is saying, hey, what's driving that underneath that? What's maybe the trauma or something that's happened to you where you believe the lie, not the truth? You need a mindset shift. And Jesus is saying, hey, follow me. I want to help renew this process for you. I want you to change your thinking about maybe God. We're here to help, not here to point out your failure. Other people, we're kind and compassionate. We are the body of Christ. And maybe even about yourself, you're worthy of love. You're not what the lie has been telling you all these years. So four things we can do. When it comes to emotions, we can label them. And man, get a, label, get a feeling sheet. Tracy and I, my wife, we try to do this as often as we can in our process of just checking in. How are we feeling? What's going on inside of us? And just share emotion. That's really healthy to do. Number two, label them and then feel them. Just let yourself feel in fact, here's a study that they've done on the brain, that your brain, when a, something negative happens to you, is like, oh, Lord, give me the word, but here's a crowd that's for me. It's like uh, when something sticks to something, it's called glue. Yeah. Oh, I can't think of the word. Yeah. It's like those balls that would stick when you throw them. Uh, Velcro. Oh, Velcro. So here's a helpful crowd. We're not working with a lot here sometimes, so... <clears throat> your brain on a negative comment is like Velcro. It sticks. It sticks easy, right? And sometimes those negative things, like Eric could teach a message. Let's just say he gets 100 emails, but the one of, you know, those skinny jeans, Eric, you're wearing aren't really appropriate or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Whatever, you know, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. You know. <laughs> negative comments can stick to your brain like Velcro. Positive comments, your brain is like Teflon. It doesn't stick unless you take that experience that's positive and savor it for 15 seconds. If you have an experience that's beautiful or positive, like seeing a flower or tamarack trees, or I see some little newborns here, right, mom? When you can just look at that granddaughter of mine and let that, let that positiveness focus on it. That's why Paul says things like, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is noble, think on these things, right? The truth of God's word, the truth that God has around us, focusing on healthy things, uh, it takes a little longer, but it can really impact the brain when you, when you actually experience it. So label it, feel it, express it to others, expressing your feelings. There's more to our feelings. Let me just speak to the men then I'm fine or I'm angry. If that's where you're at, it's time to mature. Don't worry. Rod's right behind you. Let's keep going. But you need to show up to your wife and your family with more than I'm fine or I'm angry. When you learn how to feel and uh, label it and express it, that's a sign of your health. And then here's the last one. Discern the truth. This is my feeling is this feeling connected to a truth or connected to something that's not true? Maybe a lie. Well, I think the truth is Weston doesn't like me. That's not the truth. That's, 
that, that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a thought, not a feeling. And that thought isn't even true because that wasn't Weston in the store. That was someone else, right? And so what is the truth? And so this is where Jesus says things like this in John chapter 8. Jesus says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And again, the truth about yourself, the truth about others, the truth about God. And this is why we invite you to listen and look at the teachings of Jesus. And this whole series has been about how you live the best life is looking about what God says about these things. Am I enough? Do I have enough? Is it about perfection? How can I find joy? It's about all of that. We're, that's what we're learning to discern. And Jesus says, knowing the truth will set you free. Then this promise in John 16. <laughs> I'm like pump fakes for the back room there. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that you may have peace in me. Here on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. This is what I love about the truth of Scripture. This is what I love about the teachings of Jesus. A God who enters our broken condition. He enters our twistedness, our flesh. He says, hey, you're not alone down there in despair. I'm jumping in with you, and I got you, and get on my back, and I'm going to help now take you to a better place. I'm going to restore, rescue you. And we get now to participate in their very life. We take our twisted mind and replace it with the mind of Christ. Do you see it? Are you with me? Are you picking this up today? And now as we begin to feel we begin to know what's happening, we can begin to now process that in healthy ways. So label them, feel them, express them, and discern the truth. And I would just say this in closing. You've given me 51 seconds over, but I would just say this. If you're still stuck in a rut that isn't working, I pray God would lead you to people and resources that would help you know the truth. And you're worth getting help. Don't think just maybe coming here for an hour a week is enough. No, no, no. The next step is getting in community, turning your chair face to face and opening up your life and, and being intimate to others. Intimacy is into me, you see. And knowing now that you can process life in a healthier way and people can help you learn a lie, discover it, and learning how to retrain that brain and learning how now to process emotions in healthier ways. I hope this is helpful today. Uh, take what works for you, leave what doesn't. When you see Weston in the store, know that he does like all of you. You're all in good stands <laughs> and good standing with Weston. Would you bow with me in a prayer as I conclude our time today? Father, thank you so much for this faith community where we come and gather and sing and share and give and open up the text to look at your truth. You made our hearts. We are made in your image. The scripture just bears this out. Yet our hearts can get twisted and we can get bent in directions because of pain or trauma or losses that we've had in life. And it can have such a negative effect. And it can just get us in such a ditch in life where we're hurting ourselves and hurting our others by actions. I have so been there and many times still have to just walk out my recovery because I'm following you. So I would just pray for any friend that's here today, any, any individual that finds themselves stuck and they're afraid of facing those feelings. Maybe it's abuse. Uh, maybe it's a secret of a mistake they made. Maybe it's something that happened that they could never talk about. Maybe it's just an insecurity that came from, came from an event that they need some help just rewriting that story. It's been, that negative experience has been like Teflon on their heart. And you just want to rip it off and replace something, that lie, with your truth. God, lead them to people and resources. <laughs> that they could move in and find the truth, and that truth would lead them to freedom. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, having nothing but our best interest. Uh, may we experience your peace and your joy, even in the midst of a difficult world. I ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, you guys, thank you for being here at Cedar Hills. You've been gracious today. Uh, God bless you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.